have questions, we got to use the mic, which is a little bit different format. So, and, and feel free to ask me the questions at any point in this, or we'll hope do it at the end when we go through. Um, but thanks for giving us our time. And uh, one of the reasons I would like to do this is if I can empower all of you, 800 employees in the district, to go out and, sp and get the accurate information out there, the better chance we're going to have. So. Um, I think you're about my 35th group that I've done so far, and I got another 25 or 30 to go. So I'll have this done really good by the time we're all, all done. And um, let's start, and I'll turn it over to Jerry. Thanks, Mike. I'm Jerry Wasserman, president of the board. Uh, when we hired Mike and the other candidates we were looking at, serious candidates, we let them know one of the biggest challenges we had, top three challenges, to understand our facilities for the long term going forward. We just shut down some elementary buildings, our operations, what are we going to do with those buildings? What are we going to do with our aging facilities across the district? So we pitched that to Mike day one. And what easier to report is on the facility study that, that was done. A couple of things that we sort of anchored as he started was, one, we wanted to stay with the neighborhood elementary school concept as much as possible versus a stratum type of approach of a K-1, a 2-3 building, a 3-4. We thought the community really valued that. And as much as we get some efficiencies from that, from class sizes and, and across the board, we felt that was still valuable if we could make it work. Second thing we thought was valuable was uh, two high schools. Now Mike's gonna to talk to you about the numbers, but we thought it was very important if we could, because of the size uh, that we knew we would be, is maximum opportunities for kids by having two high schools versus one high school. And really, maybe even more important than that, not losing kids in very big operations. So we thought that was important. If, again, the numbers would work to support that. Uh, lastly, I got challenged quite a bit uh, over the last year or so of saying, why don't you have a 50-year vision of where we're going? Well, I would tell people with 50-year visions have visions, meaning if I asked every one of you what our student count would have been today a decade ago, much less 20 years ago, and I gave you a multiple choice test, I'm willing to bet that nobody would have picked where we're going to be uh, unless it was by random luck. Okay, so what we do know is the kids that we're gonna have for the next 18 years are born. That we know. And what we know is then we can build a plan around that. And so uh, we commissioned Mike to take off of that. I'll shut up now. And uh, he'll show you the facility plan we've all seen his board and he's done many times, so. And we're calling our 12 to 15 year plan. And the reason um, we, we feel comfortable on 12, 15 is uh, we can determine our student population by birth rates going forward. Uh, within a reasonable rate and obviously the number of students we have will drive the needs we have for facilities. Plus, oh, we believe that's a reasonable period to take on debt before we can pay that off in the future and we'll get into the debt a little bit. Why is this needed? Um, obviously the age of our facilities and I'm going to show you that in the next slide, um, the exact age of our facilities, but you would obviously know that our, our buildings are getting to an age era where they need a, a refresh or some of them are probably near end of life. Um, we're energy and efficient in this district at this point in time. We have a number of boiler systems that are 50 and 60 years old, original boiler systems, and we lack computer control of those. And you might say in the school buildings we probably lack control. Either we've got heat or we have no heat often in our classrooms for you right now. And, th and there's some truth to that. Um, we still have some buildings that have pneumatic control, so when we turn the dial you can hear the air opening the valves that make that heating system work. That's antiquated. Uh, you can't even buy parts for those systems anymore. And today it's all controlled by, by a computer, saving the amount of energy that we want to save. We have some school safety and security issues. Our buildings were built in a time period where um, school violence wasn't an issue. Today, um, all schools are being prepared where there's a single controlled access point where students um, enter the buildings after the school day starts. That's not the case here at Northeast. You're not able to do that with the way the setup of your front of your building is. And so our plan is to change that structural setup where visitors can get, get into an entry area that's as far as they could go and then it would be forced to go through an office area for that checkpoint. Um, and, and that's how school buildings are built today. We have an aging bus fleet. Um, we have 58 buses in our fleet. The last two years because of our general fund issues, we have not been purchasing buses. So we've consciously said um, we're going to save some money there knowing that we could have some problems down the road but it was either buses or it was teachers or it was um, the materials and the supplies that you need to teach our students every day. We need um, to chase technology. We have um, the last few days or two weeks ago you definitely noticed that we had some te aging technology where when we went down for almost a week 
with some switch hardware problems behind the scenes and today I think we had a little bit of a hiccup as well and our, we need to be able to build the infrastructure that supplies the, te uh, the uh, information that you need for your students every day as well as the devices that you and your students need to have a modern day uh, learning experience. And we own too many facilities. We have 19 facilities we own at this point in time. That's not the size of the district we are today, nor will it be the size of the district going forward. So we need to get efficient and um, own the number of buildings we actually need. There is at the um, ages of our buildings, and um, if it, I think it kind of puts it in writing, makes it even more powerful. We know they're getting older. Well, we, uh, we average 61 years old, 88% of our buildings are 50 years or older. And what we call our two new newest buildings are basically 50 years old. Um, and so those are new to us at this point in time. Our oldest is uh, 88 years old, and so it's time to take a look at those and have an honest uh, conversation about them. Our buildings were built in an era where, where security was not, in it, was not thought of. We have some poor exterior lighting issues. Um, this building would be one as well. Um, the lighting around it is original lighting. Um, lighting that was requires bulbs to be placed nearly yearly at a cost. Um, and they're not very bright and they're not very ener energy efficient. Today, LED lighting's the phase. You put them up, you touch them 10 years later, and they <coughs> save you a lot of energy during that time period. In order to have a single controlled access point in a building, um, staff and students have to have the ability to get an out still for PE classes, um, athletic fields, those type of things going on in, uh, outside the building. So we would have to add door access controls to our building as well. We would have some video surveillance where it makes sense, um, particularly in the secondary buildings. You know that would be coming quite handy for uh, not only protection but also for some of the vandalism that occurs in buildings. We have aging PA systems, um, many of them that don't function in all areas of the buildings. If we had an emergency, we would need to be able to communicate to all areas of the building immediately. We can't do that at a single point in time. We have traffic flow issues. You have a little bit out here. So we just witnessed on the way in today, right? But certainly if you've been around our elementary buildings, you know we have some major traffic flow issues. We really can't change the neighborhoods that they're in, but we can change how that traffic uh, mixes. Um, those buildings were built in an era where students walked to school or they rode the yellow bus. Today about 50% of our kids arrive by their parents' cars and we have, we're mixing all three sets of that traffic. That's a safety issue and we can, we can make it where each of those traffics don't mix the safer our kids are going to be. Um, we talked about the bus fleet already that's aging and will continue to age because we're not able to buy buses through our general fund at this point in time. We have little or no control over our boiler systems. This is actually our newest boiler system in the district, and this is at Dow High School. And if you know anything about boilers today, it might be about a quarter of that size. And you can imagine the energy efficiency that comes with that. So um, our newest boiler is quite old. I think the best example of boiler systems in the district that are antiquated is East Lawn. East Lawn originally had a boiler system that was it was uh, coal burning, and then it was converted to heating oil, and now it's converted to natural gas. And so you can imagine the efficiencies there. Single pane windows are probably as old as I am, and so you don't see single pane windows anymore, but uh, we still have some in the district that need to go. We have some air quality issues because we are, our heating systems, our cooling systems are not be able to bring in the amount of fresh air that's needed when fully occupied with a thousand students in this building. And so um, we're probably bringing in single digits fresh air from the outside when we should be bringing in double digits fresh air, and that causes health issues as well. Here's our bus fleet. Like I said, we have 58 buses, and the standard in, in the state of Michigan generally is 10 to 12 years or 200,000 miles. Um, we can push those engines in transmissions usually a little past 200,000 if need be, but it's usually the bodies in Michigan that, that catches us. And after about 12, 14 years, those frames are about ready to go underneath those buses, and so that's an issue. The bottom bullet point is the one you have to no take notice for me, and that's 78% of our fleet will be over that standard by 2018, and that's a problem. Well, there's no way we can do that through our general fund at um, $75,000 to $100,000 a bus. This slide says 18 buildings. I say 19 because I count the bus facility in there as well. And we are proposing to be right size for our population, helping our general fund be in the right amount of dollars spent. Well, let's not spend dollars on buildings, let's sp spend dollars on educating students. And uh, we have 11 buildings in the district uh, when we're done proposing here. What we really are asking to do is take on debt. 
and is that normal in our state? Well, it's abnormal not to. Um, only 5% of the districts in the state of Michigan do not have debt. We're one of those. And when we went to the Treasury, the last time we had debt was in the 1960s. And that was the longest period of time they've ever seen a district go without debt. So that's a good thing. We've been very responsible to our taxpayers for a number of years, maintaining our buildings. But there's also a side effect of that, and that's all of those buildings are hitting a need at the same time. And um, that, that's going to cause a problem for us as we get there. Um, as you know, we once had a sinking fund who helped maintain the buildings. So it's kind of a pay-as-you-go. You collect some taxes, you do a repair. It's kind of what we hope to do in our homes. Save up some money, replace the carpet. Save up some money, put the shingles on. But when the house gets 50, 60 years old and we have to get the bathrooms and the kitchens and do the floors, we're probably borrowing some equity out of that house to do that. That's where we are as a district, and we're asking to borrow against our, our buildings in order to fix them back up. Get an example of what, what debt millage rates look like. Here's our county. And so within our county, all of the public school districts except us have debt. In fact, Coleman just approved two new mills in the November election. And so they're now at 3.83 mills going forward. And one of the things I want you to note, note, note in here when I show these slides is what a typical millage rate looks like. These are the districts that surround us in the, on the outer counties around us. And you can see their millage rates compared to MPS having no, no debt. And these are districts that we would compare ourselves to statewide, districts that look like us by size or community or how our students achieve. And you can see different various millage rates in there as well. Enrollment's going to drive our facility needs, as I said earlier. Uh, we're at now we're about 7,800 students. We can project that we're going to hit a bottom of 7,200 students. And the reason we are is that the elementaries have kind of stabilized, but your, the biggest classes in the district are 7 through 12. You know that well. You just move one big class through um, the middle school to the high school. Once those big classes graduate out and the smaller ones move all the way through the system, we're going to go down to 7,200. And we're pretty, we're pretty uh, uh, confident in that number. We could be off 50 to 100 students either way, but that wouldn't change the number of facilities we would need if we are. Um, the myth out there, uh, and Jerry explained about the two high schools, um, at one time you could have thought about going down to a high school. I don't think it would have been educationally sound to, but you had five secondary buildings. But today you have four secondary buildings when you close Central. Um, you now have, do not have the space to do that. You could have possibly moved ninth grade down, try to jam those into the, into the high school and go to one financially. But that's not even a possibility as we go forward now. We would be 50% over capacity at our lowest count of Midland High School, which is the largest high school. So it doesn't fit anymore. Is there room in the middle schools? No, you'd be 85% over capacity of Northeast, which holds the larger population of the two buildings. So we don't do no longer fit into that kind of model. And when we made the decision to uh, close Central, it wasn't with a vacuum of that knowledge. Meaning we recognized that was an option, but we did not, and I've already failed to mention at the beginning, did not want to go to three-year high schools. Why? Because the ninth grade is so important to all those kids, and especially our college-bound kids, is the vast majority of our kids these days, to have that packaged from ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th, especially 9th, 10th, and 11th. In reality, we'd have a two-year high school for college applications at 10, 11. So we really thought that was important and that enabled us to shut down Central and go forward. <coughs> Central was the oldest building as well in yep. the district. So it seemed to make sense. And one of the things I want you to note on the slide is um, with that and knowing what our role, we know we do not need our vacant buildings in the next 10 to 12 years because that's going to play into the picture here when we talk about what we should do with all those vacant buildings. What have we done to prepare to bring this proposal forward? Well, we um, knew that we wanted someone looking at our buildings besides just us. And so we went out and had professionals come in and take a look. We had an um, architect firm and a construction manager firm that are the experts in the state on school buildings. They've walked your buildings. You may remember them walking your buildings last spring, taking a look at those buildings. And they put together a report and they presented it to the board in July. The school board wanted input from our commu community, and so in August, um, some of you may have served on the, on the employee group. We had four different groups of people. We had a community leaders group, a parents group, a current and retired staff group, and retired uh, board members as well. 
Um, we gained some feedback from there. We studied our millage rates and what dollar amount could we bring in with a reasonable millage rate in order to do the repairs, the refurbishing that we're talking about. Now we're ready to present that to the community as we've been out presenting. These are the four issues that we are going to address. The four themes of the bond proposal is student safety and security, increase our energy efficiency, address our aging facilities, refurbish them, replace equipment, and deal with our closed buildings, and create 21st century learning space. And we're going to talk about that a little bit further, that our buildings really aren't 21st century learning spaces today. Under student safety and security, I've covered a number of these, so I'll move through this fairly quick. Um, we talked about secure entryways, improved traffic flow, exterior lighting, door access controls to get in and out once the building's secured, expand our video surveillance, replace those aging PA systems, and update our bus fleet. And the bus fleet's a safety issue. If we're going to run buses past the age that have frame issues, students aren't really on the best buses, or the safest buses out there. And if we age our fleet out and we have less buses, then we have to expand our walk zones because we're going to be able to transport fewer students, and that's an issue as well. On our energy efficiency, um, we know that we have old boilers, but we also have old ventilator units in your classrooms. They actually look kind of like a 1950 car in your room. They're kind of old, and, um, and the equipment's old inside of them, and so they're not very efficient. Um, we're looking for that district-wide management system. Right now, as, as we probably let students out, we have lots of lights still on in this building, and um, there's somebody going around trying to get some of those turned off where we would have a management system that would automatically shut your lights off at when you dis when you dismiss, and you can override that if you're still in your room, and then it'll shut it back off. I bet our gymnasium lights are on. I bet our cafeteria lights are probably on right now, and we're burning energy in 19 buildings that we shouldn't be doing. Single pane windows, we talked about, they're energy inefficient, should be gone, and we, we need to upgrade those lighting controls, which I just talked about. I do you want to talk about parks? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I think I mentioned that a little later as well, but you know, those old heater units, um, often when a part goes in there, we actually have to not only replace those parts at a cost, and that's cost under general fund money, but we often have to get them made. That's how old they are. So when we roll them out, there isn't a part no longer on the shelf to replace that because it's so old. And so you have to go to a manufacturer and say, can you rebuild, manufacture a part for this uh, heating and cooling unit? That's a problem. So 21st century learning space. Um, we're sitting in a, a, I'm going to call it a library. I know we're trying to call them media centers, but it's really a library still. And that's, that's gone. Um, today, they should be media centers. And what does a modern day media, media center look like? Well, it's the ability to enhance sound, which we don't have in here. It's the ability to, to project in multiple ways and multiple screens at one time. Um, it's to have the technology in there uh, where you get a student to learn. But yes, there's still print available and all that as well. Well, our media centers lack that. Um, if you've been into our elementary media centers, they really lack that. Many of them are just, you go to the end of the hallway, there's a little, little larger spot at the end of the hallway with some bookshelves put up with uh, reading, print reading for the students. And that's what we call a media center. And um, that's not 21st century learning. So uh, our architect has some ideas about changing that. When he was in our elementary buildings, um, that was his biggest issue he saw. But then he also noticed our gymnasium cafeterias that serve as both in our elementaries are really undersized for the amount of students we have. Uh, but he looked at that big square space and he said, well, I could make a great 21st century media center in that square space, which means he would then put on a big square new gymnasium cafeteria under our five elementaries that we're proposing hanging on to, and I'll show you that in a minute. That's an example of 21st century learning space, as well as you know your classrooms need to change to be more open and more collaborative and have the tools in there to do what I just said, enhance sound, um, being uh, a media up on, on the walls to be able to uh, teach your students, have the devices for interaction that you need. And so that's part of our, our 21st century learning space plan. This slide's going to take me the longest time to explain. This is how we're going to get from 19 buildings to 11. And I think maybe this is the one that we need to uh, pass this information out the most to our community because I think there's some who would like to make this sound different than it really is. Um, when our architect reviewed all our buildings, he took a look at um, East Lawn, which is 69 years old, 
and as you know, many of you know, has some major structural issues to it, and it has the very wet basement where we have to move students out of the basement every spring, and then allow them to go back down, which is a humidity problem for the students as well as we go forward. And so he suggests that we do not put money into East Lawn at this time, that you'd be putting good money into a very poor building that does not make sense. He took a look at Carpenter, our oldest building, 88 years old, and structurally it's in pretty good shape. But it's not really um, good 21st century learning space in there. When he looks at running modern day heating cooling systems in there, there's a lot of roadblocks. There's not a lot of space in the ceilings. Uh, it would be very costly to do so. And to refurbish Carpenter would cost us five to eight million dollars. And he's saying oh, you do that and you'll get 10 to 15 more years out of it, which would make it 100 years old. And so does that seem to make a lot of sense? Uh, probably not. And so uh, we're not looking at doing anything with Carpenter as far as putting money in there as well. And I'll explain, we are looking at repurposing Carpenter for something. Then he went over and took a look at Central. And Central was a 1940s high school, a very large piece of property, a very large building that we're operating for an auditorium, our only auditorium in the district, and the gymnasium space, which we need to run all of our middle school athletic programs, and it's used by the community center all the time. Um, that's really the, the main purpose of Central Middle School at this point. He took a look at that and he believes if we, he removed the um, pieces that are connected to the auditorium on the outside that would allow him to enlarge that stage of the auditorium, refurbish it with lighting, seating, all the things that a modern day auditorium have, change the ceiling for sound a little bit, and we'd have a modern day auditorium that could serve 60 years going forward. He would go into the school, the remaining part of the school, and refurbish the gymnasium. Gymnasiums are really big square boxes, so if he gutted it to a big square box, including taking those cement steps out, he could build a whole brand new gymnasium inside of that gym. He would refurbish the cafeteria, which is in relatively good shape. By the way, the most expensive things to build on the schools are gymnasiums, uh, auditoriums, and cafeterias. And then he would remove the original 1940 high school classrooms on that building which were converted to middle school classrooms, which cannot be converted to elementary classrooms. He would remove those and he would build elementary classrooms onto the central uh, building. And we would have an elementary school that can last us 60 years going forward. We would go from three buildings that we own, East Lawn, Carpenter, and Central, three of them that were operating, down to one building that were operating that would serve those students going forward. What do we, what do, we do with those buildings? Well, East Lawn, there's really not a purpose for it. There's really uh, no need for it. We would take East Lawn down and we would turn that into green space. We'd talk to the community about the purpose of the green space. We have a little league fields on the back. We hear they may need more space. We'd work with that. Schools do not pay taxes on property. And so uh, it doesn't cost us anything to own vacant property. Do it does cost us some maintenance money if we're owning a building on that vacant property. Um, we would repurpose Carpenter. We have some community partners who would uh, provide programs in there. They would pay the utility cost. We'd still own the building, but the cost is the utility cost, and we would have that repurposed for a while. Um, a historical building that keeps serving our community in a different way than it is today, but keeps serving our community going forward. We would look at our other buildings throughout the district, and um, we'd take a look at Parkdale. And uh, that piece of property is the main part of Midland High Campus. Most of that space is used. And we would take Parkdale down as well. Franklin School is in the neighborhood, a very small piece of property that is not large enough to run a school building again. We would take Franklin School down and we would sell that piece of property and let it go back on the tax rolls and someone maybe build some homes or something on that piece of property. State Street is the old abandoned building next to the administration center. Can, it's been condemned. It cannot be used for anything. So we would take that building down next to the administration center. Cook School is the original 1948 school. Um, really no purpose for it, as we showed, for the next 10 to 12 years. And so it's been closed for three. It's going to sit there for 10 to 12 more years, deteriorating. And we don't even know if we'll need it by then. We really don't expect growth on that other side. But there is the belief that Midland will grow again one day, and that growth would be to the west or to the north. And to be prepared for that, we, none of us would probably be here, but somebody about 20 years from now, if we get that growth, will have to make a decision should there be a school over in those neighborhoods. We suggest that we take Cook down 
and ho hold on to that piece of property. It's part of a city park right now. Let it be used for that, and then let someone make that decision in the future. Someone bought that property in the 1940s probably for a few hundred dollars. Today it would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy that, a size piece of property and maybe more in the, the future. Um, if we do grow to the north, we do not expect it to be as far more north as mills. So we see no purpose for mills. We would take mills down, sell that property, then go back on the tax rolls. If we grow to the north, it probably is what we're seeing right now, a little growth out in Larkin Township, and we own a piece of property that someone bought many years ago in Larkin, and we would be set for that as well in the future going forward. Let me re-talk about closed facilities a little bit. So those, our closed facilities have been closed two, three, four years at this point in time. They're deteriorating in condition. And let me remind you, many were built in the 40s, Cook 1948. To reopen a building today that's been closed for two years without students in it, you have to meet all modern day school standards. If we close Northeast, it wouldn't meet any modern day school standards. And I'm not talking just, but including fire suppression, fire alarms, all those pieces. We're also talking handicap access all the new handicap rules that are for a school building. But even a bigger cost than that is today, the number of bathrooms we build onto a facility is three times the amount of bathrooms and toilets that we have in, in, in any of these buildings. And so the cost to reopen any one of these buildings today is $5 million. You can build a brand new elementary for 20. So we don't know that we're ever gonna need them again. And what, what condition will they be in after they've been closed 15 or 20 years? And would you put that kind of money into that building at that point in time? Cook would be 100 years old by the time you need it. Probably doesn't make sense to do that. And so um, that's why we're suggesting what we're suggesting going forward. If I left anything out there, I think you're good. So this plan would bring us from 19 oh, down, down to 11 buildings. There is, there is one thing. You've said it once before. I think it's worth repeating. And that is we are very confident of our numbers for the next 18 years. So we're very confident that those buildings aren't going to be used or needed for 18 years. So it gives you the confidence then to make the decision based on that versus, oh, gee, I wonder what we're going to be a decade from now. We pretty much know because kids are born and, uh, and the rest of the story follows that. Yeah, the other thing I think I want to add is um, East Lawn and Carpenter combined with today's numbers, about 600 students. It would be about the size of Siebert. Well, Siebert's about 600 students right now. So it's not too large, um, but it, it's a larger school. Um, it, it is majority of, of Title I students in there, and I've had people ask me, Mike, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And this is my 30th year in education, and I'm not sure of the answer to that, um, because having a lot of Title kids who need programs targeted at them on one building would be easier to supply that. Now, in your classrooms, we know we'd like a better mix of students to, you know, for teaching, and so one of the things we're thinking about doing, and probably will do, is we're going to open that kind of like a magnet school. We're going to open a STEM school there, or a STEAM school, where you'd add the arts, since the auditorium's right there available, and we think we can draw students from other parts of the neighborhood into there and create that mix, but certainly keep the title status. We want to keep the title status because that brings a lot of federal dollars in to provide the intervention programs that those students and parents need. And so, um, community center. The, the location to the community center was a major issue. Um, that's one of the reasons East Lawn was saved originally. And this location is even better than East Lawn. They have to actually cross a road right now to get to the community center from East Lawn. And now that is a George that goes through that's now blocked off there. They don't even have to cross the road to go to get there from the central campus to this community center. So we think that's a plus as well. 12 to 15 years was in the back of our mind as well. To position the district in the future to, do, to be able to do what they're going to need to do in the future. And that is readdress their buildings again. Because all of our buildings, even under our plan, will have a number of buildings that will possibly have needs going further out. And we're sitting in one right now. Our architect tells us right now that with a refurbish to northeast, we can get 20 more years out of it. With no refurbishing, we're going to get 12 years out of it. And so somewhere in the future, citizens are going to have to take a look and say, what do we do with Northeast? And we want to put them in a position where they don't have debt and they can decide what to do with Northeast. Fifteen years from now, we may need only one middle school, so it's not a problem. Fifteen years from now, we may need a second middle school, but it's to the north. We grew so much to the north. 
that they can make that decision in the future and we want to be able to position them to do that. We also know that some of our elementary buildings will be approaching that magical 75, 80 years old where they're getting to the near end of their life, Plymouth being one of those elementaries that would be reaching that age. And we want to make sure our voters are in a position to do that 12 to 15 years from now. Our debt would be nearly paid off that we're asking to take on right now and that would give them a chance to either renew the that military going forward and be able to do more work into the district. And so we thought that was a very important thing we should add. <coughs> and, and Mike, we've been asked, well, what if you're wrong? Well, if we're wrong because town grew a lot faster and a lot more, that's a great problem to have. We'll fix that problem. If it's a lot worse, we will not have overspent in facilities we may not need. To Mike's last point, we'll have buttress those up that are long-term facilities. We'll have made the midterm facilities midterm livable. And if things go worse for some odd reason, then we're not over investing on a wrong premise going forward. There's some side benefits to our bond program as well. Um, as most of you know, our general fund is in dire straits. We're, we've spent um, more money than we take in for a number of years now, and we've relied on our fund balance. Our fund balance will be at a level where we'll have to borrow funds to, to make payroll. So if you don't know how school finance works, we do not get paid in August, September from the, from the state. We get a bigger payment in October because um, they wait till student counts are in. Um, during that time period, when you don't get paid for two months, you don't get, we don't pay you for two months, you need cash flow to cover your bills. Our cash flow will be to, to a point next year that we'll have to go borrow money to make our cash flow and wait for October payment to pay that off. So you can see, we, can, we must balance our budget. We cannot continue to spend our cash flow down. So we're looking for <coughs> ways to do that, and obviously some of that is still going to be further reductions in the district. This is not the sole answer to it, but if we can soften the blow of the reductions by being creative, why would we not do so? The bond, right now we're spending about $900,000 a year on technology, and we're not keeping up. And so you can only imagine that number would grow in the future, our need. And if we could, for the next 10 years, not have to spend $900,000 a year on technology, that's a plus to our general fund right there. Right now on busing, we should be applying seven buses a year. I have not for two years in a row. Um, buses range from 75,000 to 100,000. So you could put a million dollars of savings per year under busing going forward for the next 10 years. Someday those will have to come back, but for the next 10 years they would be covered. With all the energy equipment and all the energy controls that get put in the districts, our savings on energy will be in the six figures, somewhere around $150,000 a year at today's dollars going forward. That's relief to your general fund. Energy is our third largest budget item. Lower maintenance costs, we talked about those heating units that are aging out and having to buy expensive parts for them, having our guys spend a lot of maintenance time in there. You would just automatically assume with newer equipment in our districts that we'd, we'd have lower maintenance costs going forward. The consolidation of 19 buildings down to 11, or Central becoming the campus, three buildings, Carpenter, East Lawn Central into one, um, that there would be efficiencies in there, uh, and we would have considerable saving in those dollars as well. So our general fund certainly could use that relief, and uh, it would lessen the blow that we're looking to have to do in the next few years. You've seen most of these work lists. <coughs> they look very similar for the five elementary schools. Um, that are going to get some refurbishing done to them. Um, these work lists cannot capture all the work um, on, on these lists. If you would really like to see more detail on that, on, than that, there's a 72-page document on our website that you can get into that detail and, and, and read all about it if, that, if you'd like to do that. They are estimates because they're only estimates until we actually uh, get an approval. And once we get an approval, then they, they bid those projects and get actual dollars and design going forward. Uh, but these, these are the work lists. All five elementaries look similar. They're about the same age. The two middle schools are similar with Northeast having a slightly different spin because this building has some structural issues they need to address in order to get the 20 years that we would like to get out of it going forward. If you haven't seen those, they're all on our website. The two high schools are similar. Um, actually, Dow High's um, got a little more work than Midland High because Midland High's had most of the refreshes. Um, through the sinking fund and so Dow High uh, it had, didn't need it back then because it was newer but now it's getting to be the building that has some needs going forward. What are we asking for? Now let's go back and I showed you those debt figures from other districts in our county. We're asking for 2.95 mills which would keep us the lowest in our county. It would keep us the lowest in around our area and one of the lowest in the state going forward. Um, what is a mill? To get a feel for that 
Um, if you had a house that had a $200,000 market value, it'd have a hundred thousand tax taxable value. It'd be about $295 a year. Um, we actually have a tax rate calculator on our website. If you take your last tax bill, you go there, you put the numbers in, it'll tell you exactly what this will cost you going forward. So if you go to our website, there's a lot of information on the bond on our website right now going forward. We think staying at that low end and accomplishing the amount of work we could do is very important. Just two and a half years ago, if you're a Midland resident, you were paying 2.5 mils on a sinking fund that you're not paying, you have been paying for two and a half years. And so we're asking you to go back to pay about the same number that you were paying just two and a half years ago to do this work. The bonds are sold off in three series because you don't need all the money up front. And that's how the work is done. And what happens if we don't do this, if we delay? This isn't approved. Well, Northeast doesn't last 20, it last 12 years. And that means somewhere down the road, someone's not going to be asking for 2.95 mills to uh, refurbish buildings. They're asking many more mills to replace a building that's aged out, along with East Lawn that's aged out. It also means that we're sitting in buildings that are not safe and secure, burning energy it should be spending out of a general fund. Bus fleet is going to age out and become unsafe because we don't have general fund dollars to replace them, and we're going to fall behind with technology and therefore instruction. So it, it's not a pretty <coughs> picture. I think we're at a crossroad. We can't keep kicking the can down the road. I think the timing's right to, to begin the process of updating our fleet of buildings, to close those buildings we don't need, and then leave ourselves in a position to continue to update those buildings as we go forward. In the 1960s, Somebody did that when they built Dow High School, Woodcrest Elementary. Now is it our turn to go ahead and invest in our district to make sure that district continues to go forward. That is the actual ballot language. Um, a lot of legalese in there that's required by the Treasury, um, but it's got the gist of the 2.95 mills in there. You've seen these display boards in your buildings. Northeast has one out here, and those are on our website as well. And we are now to the point where you get to ask all kinds of questions if you want. Except for one thing, Mike. Do you want to touch on sinking fund spending in the past, especially around Parkdale? So um, I guess the first thing I'd say about sinking fund is um, I could tell people when I walk out there, I knew there was going to be the question about what, what about all the sinking fund dollars you have? And I could say, hey, I wasn't here. Don't bother me with that. But that's not going to, the answer's not going to fly. So what I did is I went back and I pulled research so I can answer that question. I pulled board, old board packets. I pulled some treasury reports to see what would really occur during those sinking fund dollars. Our architect says our buildings have great bones to them. They're in pretty good shape. Um, so they can be refurbished because you were putting money into them at about $3 million a year through the sinking fund. Um, and so there, there, are work, there is work to be done, but luckily you still have a structural build, structured building that can do that. When we went back and looked at the sinking fund dollars, was there money put into buildings that were closed prior to their closing? Um, yes, four to five years prior to their closing, except for Parkdale. And I'll explain that one in a second. Um, and so most of the buildings had some sinking funds put into about five years before they closed them. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. I don't know if anybody could have saw in 2005, 2004, that the economy was going to take the greatest hit that's ever had in Michigan since the Great Depression. Student population was going to decrease, and you weren't going to need those buildings in 2007, 8, 9 when you closed them. Hindsight's a great thing, so one can figure that one out. Parkdale, there was money put in the year before it was closed. Um, the board's just got to own that one. It occurred. But if you recall, when they put a, a closure committee together, they originally were asked to look at closing four schools. And they decided to close five because they could see that um, with our population decline, that, that they were going to end up doing this again. They were going to close four, and then a couple years later, they're going to have to close another one. Why do that twice? Why go through that pain twice? Let's do that. And so when they began to look at the fifth one, no one expected that fifth one to be Parkdale. They really expected it to be East Lawn. The proximity of East Lawn to the community center um, saved it, and it ended up being East Lawn, and everyone was caught off guard, and Parkdale was the one that was closed. So the answer is yes, Parkdale, there was some money spent prior to its closing. Um, I think we answered that problem with the community center this time. It's, we're going to move those two buildings, East Lawn, Carpenter, into Central, which is actually a better location to the community center than East Lawn. And I'll be right up front. I'll own that decision on the Parkdale. Um, when it came time, Mike said it well. 
when we had to make the decision, I could see very clearly the demographics were fairly big, that if we didn't shut it down, shut another building down then, we'd be here discussing shutting one down today uh, because of the shifting population. And if we had just invested 700,000 in Parkdale, we could shut it down then, or have invested 700,000 in Parkdale and shut it down today. Either case, the 700,000 have been spent. So we just said, let's pick the scab one time. Let's not redistrict all these kids and these families twice in a three-year period. Let's own the $700,000 and let's, let's do it right the first time and be done with it.